I'm really excited to be here today and grateful to be here with you. If you would, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. Um, that's where we're going to be today. Uh, before we get there, uh, I feel like it's really important to say that um, I have taken note of all of the potlucks that are going on here, and I've already sent word back to my church to let them know I'm transferring my membership here um, so that I can be part of those uh, potlucks with you, because what Cole didn't tell you is that I like to eat, um, and I love a good home-cooked meal, um, so I don't live that far from any of you. So if any of you just feel like cooking a meal sometime and sending it my way, make enough for about 25 people in my house, probably. Just kidding. We've got four kids. Um, number five is on the way. Uh, we're having a, a baby girl um, here in May. Uh, super excited about that. I brought one of my kids along with me this morning, Gabe. Uh, Gabe has gone on to be with uh, the Children's Church this morning, and um, he is one of our four one of three boys, uh, one of four of our kids, um, and then in May we'll add, uh, we'll add a little girl, uh, Maggie uh, will be her name, Margaret, Margaret Ellen Brewer. So pretty excited about that. Uh, so Mark chapter 12 um, is where we're going to be this morning, and it's kind of an interesting approach to what, what, what I think is, is a little bit of an unconventional approach to um, a message on church planting. And so I want to share a little bit about um, our church and, and what we've been doing, but, but definitely want to um, ground that today in, in God's Word. And so before, before I do get started, um, I'm making a few assumptions this morning. Um, I'm making a few assumptions uh, being here um, at Grace Community um, on, on really four different levels. Um, the first assumption that I'm making is that, is that those who are listening today here in the church, the saints who are gathered here today, uh, my first assumption is that you have a heart for evangelism. Um, you have a heart to see people come to know Jesus. Uh, we've seen that this morning. Uh, we saw how all of you got out of your seats and came and laid hands and prayed uh, for, for these three young ladies who have given their life to Christ. And so I'm assuming that that is something that gets you excited. That's something that gets the wheels turning inside of you. So I'm assuming that this morning as I preach this message, um, the second thing that I'm assuming is that you have a heart for discipleship. Uh, that you have a heart to see people come to know Christ. And so oftentimes we, we separate evangelism from discipleship. I don't think biblically there's as much of a, as much of a distinction between the two. Um, we don't see Jesus saying, um, go and um, get people saved um, and then just, if you want to, disciple them. It's no, go and make disciples. And so I'm assuming that these three ladies that came here this morning and anyone else that you see come to know Christ you have a desire to see them um, become more and more faithfully de devoted followers of Jesus who live their life um, to the fullest extent um, to what God has prepared and planned for them. Um, Ephesians chapter two uh, just tells us that, that God has, has, um, has, has laid out the works that we would do in our life, that we would, that we would be faithful um, in, in doing the work that he has laid out for us. And so um, those two things, the third thing that I'm, that I'm, we're kind of moving a little bit farther out, third thing that I'm assuming is that you have a heart for the local church, um, that you think that this gathering place, uh, that this time each Sunday morning um, and in other times throughout the week, whenever you may gather, um, is very crucial um, to your growth as a follower of Christ, as a disciple. Um, and so I'm assuming that, I'm assuming that, that you see in scripture where the local church um, is the way that God has chosen to get his word to the ends of the earth. Um, and so I do believe that, that all throughout the earth, what some people may call the church universal, that, that we, we know brothers and sisters all throughout the world, that we can go anywhere and we can, we can rub shoulders and come across people who know Christ I and mean, who love Christ, but that God has specifically ordained through his grace and his mercy to the world, to our communities, to ourselves, for our discipleship, the local church. So I'm assuming that the local church is, is very high up on your priority list. Um, and then, the, and then the, the final thing that I'm, that I'm assuming as I talk about church planning this morning is that you have a heart um, and a desire to see Christ return. Um, in fact, Mark chapter 12 is where we're at today. In the very next chapter, Jesus is giving some signs of the close of the age. And one of the things that he says in Mark 13 verse 10, it says, before Christ returns, the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And so, in our evangelism, in our discipleship, in our heart for the local church, in our heart for church planting, we are, we are, we are hoping and praying that, that everyone who Christ has come to save would come to know Christ. 
And I believe that they will. I believe that God has set his sight on those whom he loves, those whom he has chosen, and those who he has come to save and redeem, and he will do that. And Jesus says right here, the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. That's how we can know that the signs of the times are coming. And so those are some things that I'm assuming this morning. Um, and so here's, here's, here's what, what, I'm, what I'm going to do and what I'm not gonna do. I'm not gonna talk this morning on all of the ins and outs of, of, of what church planting is and what it's not. Um, I'm just gonna give us a, a basis of, of how to think about church planting because my assumption in those four things that if, you, that, that if my assumptions are correct, then church planting is just going to be a natural, uh, a natural next step for us. If we desire to see people come to Christ, desire to, people, desire to see people uh, become disciples of Jesus, desire to see the local church strengthen, desire to see Christ return, then I just believe that church planting is just one of those very natural things that, that we don't even honestly have to put too much energy and, and thought towards because it will just flow out of these things that we are passionate about. And so um, I, I do want to read this morning from Mark chapter 12. Um, and, and here's kind of my goal this morning. My goal is to connect for us the Great Commission, which Jesus gives to his disciples, with the Great Commandment. Um, I believe that it is somewhat of a, of a modern construct that, that, that we have somehow separated these two things. That, that for, for whatever reason, as we think about uh, declaring the gospel to all nations, making disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all that he has commanded, somehow we have gotten away from attaching that to something else that Christ commanded us and to love God above all else and to love our neighbor as ourself. And so I believe that those two things are intrinsically connected and they cannot be separated. One without the other um, at, at, at best um, is, is going to harm people that we are trying to reach. At worst, it is being unfaithful to the inerrant, sufficient, um, holy, inspired word of God. And we don't want to find ourselves in that place. And so I just wanna read for you Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 28 through 34. It says this, and one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you're right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one and one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. I think it's really important as we, as we read this and as we hear this this morning that um, I'm not gonna go into to all of the, I, first of all, don't let me fool you into thinking that, I'm, that, that I know all of it, but, but I'm not, my goal this morning is not to go into all of the, the context and historical background of this passage this morning, but I do wanna provide just a little bit of a broad context for the book of Mark. Um, and who Mark is writing to. I think it's important when we come to scripture, we know, hey, why is this person writing this? Who is he writing to? Um, to, to who is, um, is, is, is Mark intending to hear this, this message? And, and what purpose does he have? And so um, a year ago, uh, we planted Grace Harbor Church. Um, it will, it, it's actually a little bit over a year ago, but about a year ago, we started gathering weekly on Sunday mornings for a time of preaching, a time of singing, a time of gathering, communion, and baptism, and all of those, those things. And uh, we started that Sunday a series on the book of Mark. The plan was um, to, to be in Mark for about eight weeks. Um, eight weeks in, we were almost through chapter two of Mark. Um, there's 16 chapters, and so we started telling our people, hey, listen, this was originally an eight-week series. We should be through with Mark sometime next year, uh, so just hang with us. Um, and so Mark has been a very special, significant book to me, to our church, to our, to our, to our body there. Um, and, and so one of the things that we have gathered from the book of Mark is one of the things that Mark is trying to accomplish in his gospel 
um, as he is trying to present Jesus, we see this in the opening verses in the opening chapter. One of the things that we see Mark attempting to do here is to present Jesus, Jesus Christ, as the long-awaited Messiah that the Jews have been waiting on for a long time. If you go into the Old Testament, just time after time, the, the, the Old Testament, the Jews know someone is coming to deliver us. Someone is coming, someone is coming, someone's going to conquer our enemies. And to them, they were thinking of it a little bit differently than what God had in mind. But nonetheless, they knew someone was going to come. And so Mark has an audience of, of Jews who he's writing to and he's saying, hey, listen, Jesus, the one who's busting on the scene today is the one that God has been talking to you about for thousands and thousands of years. That's him, that's Jesus. And so, so he's not only saying that's him, but he's also trying to solidify the fact that Jesus is not only the coming Messiah, he, Jesus is the king of all. He is the king over everything. He is king over the earth. He is king over the rulers and the dominions. And then over the next few chapters, we see Mark spelling out for us that Jesus is casting out demons. He's healing the sick. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's doing all sorts of these different things. And it's all just a, a small thing for us to see that surely Jesus is the king. In fact, I believe it's back in, in the early chapters of, of Mark where they, the, the men lower their friend down through the roof and, and, he, and, and Jesus heals him. And, and they said, by what authority do you have to do this? And Jesus says, which is, it, which, is it, uh, which is it easier to say, get up and walk or your sins are forgiven? And then he says, just so that you know that I can do both, we're gonna make the man get up and walk. And surely if I can do that, I have the authority to forgive his sins. And so Jesus is just kind of coming through here and Mark saying, hey, this is the king. This is the king. You better listen to him because he is the king. And so Jesus is in fact, the long-awaited Messiah who's come to rescue his people and establish himself as the rightful king um, of the kingdom of God. Guess what? Being a king qualifies you. Being a king qualifies you for certain things. And when you're Jesus and when you're perfect and you live a righteous life, you're qualified for even more. You're qualified to, to, to humbly and boldly ask people to follow you. Say, follow me. I am worthy of being followed. Hey, guess what? Not all kings that our earth has known are worthy of being followed, are they? They may have the status, they may have the power, they may have the position, but they're not all worthy of being followed. Jesus is saying, I am worthy for you to, to take up your cross and to follow me. I'm worthy of that. And Jesus is saying that over and over again. And so being the king qualifies Jesus, yet Jesus not only reveals to us the truth of his kingship, but he also reveals to us the power of the love that he has for those whom he has come to dwell among, right? He has shown us his love. Again, as, as I said, he has the authority over sin, over death, over demons, and over sickness. And all of this is merely an affirmation of his deity. Hang with me, I'm getting to where we're going. So since Jesus is not only the king, but he is a loving, just, rightful king, as Mark would present to us, there are two very necessary responses. There are two necessary responses to him. First, we recognize his authority. We submit ourselves to him. We just, we just recognize, you know what? Yeah, there's something to this, this king. There's something about this king where I have to recognize and I have to, to proclaim Jesus is Lord. Jesus is our king. Secondly, I kind of said this, I kind of, uh, I, I, I kind of spilled this already, but, but this is a different point. Secondly, if we recognize his authority, we must submit ourselves to him. So we not only recognize him, yes, he's the king, he is who has come, he is who we've been longing for and waiting for, but we say because of who Christ is and who he claims to be, we must submit ourselves to him. But there's something really cool about this. Jesus never, as as, as wrongful kings have done several times throughout history, Jesus never asks us to submit ourselves to him in any begrudging way. He says, you know what? You can trust me because I love you and I have what is best for you in mind. Therefore, as you submit yourself to me, you can do it in confidence, knowing that I love you, knowing that, that you can follow me in joy and happiness knowing that I will not fail you. 
So we submit ourselves to him not begrudgingly, but willingly. And this is so much different from the way that we relate to earthly kings, isn't it? I mean, even the, even the kings and the authorities that we love, I mean, there's sometimes where they step on our toes, right? And, 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 and Jesus, by the way, is not immune to stepping on your toes. He, he very well might step on your toes. But Jesus is saying, I am the king who has the, your, best, your best in mind. And I will not fail you. I will not let you down. I will do this. So all of this to get us back to Mark chapter 12. Knowing these things, recognizing the authority of Christ, submitting ourselves to Christ, seeing what Mark is establishing here, that Jesus is the king who is worthy to be worshiped and followed and submitted to. Knowing this about him and acknowledging this, we must listen when Christ speaks. When Jesus opens his mouth, we better listen. You know, another one of the assumptions that I might have left out this morning is that we, that, that we, um, that, that we value God's word um, as, as the inerrant, um, sufficient, infallible word of God. And there's a lot of nuance even in some of those things. Some, some people that I know and love would, would have a little bit of a hard time seeing that, that, that scripture without error they would not in any way say that, that, um, that, it, that, that it's not infallible. They would say, absolutely, it is, it is true in everything that it sets out to do. I disagree with them. I, I hold to um, inerrancy. I hold into infallibility. I hold to sufficiency. I hold to all of those things. And so if we assume that, then we must assume that when Jesus spoke, he, he didn't compartmentalize things like we do. You and I are really good about compartmentalizing things, aren't we? We're good at compartmentalizing this area of our life with another area of life. Let's just take this morning, for example. Let's take our Christian walk. We are really good at compartmentalizing as a culture, uh, compartmentalizing the Sunday morning gathering uh, with the way that Christ has called us to live the other days of the week. We've got our Sunday, and then once Sunday's over, we can check that off the list, and then we go on with our life Monday through Friday, and and then that's okay because we'll be back in the Lord's house on Sunday. Praise the Lord, brother, right? We're gonna be right back in that place on Sunday because we're so good at compartmentalizing. But we have to view, view God, we have to view Jesus as one who never sinned, was, without, was with, without sin, who was perfectly holy, lived a righteous life. We must view Jesus as one who would not have compartmentalized anything. And so here in Mark 12, when Jesus is saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. That leads us, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over to Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 28. If you want to, you can follow me there. That leads us here to Matthew 28. Jesus is, is, um, is ascending. He is, he is, um, he is, is this is post-resurrection, pre-ascension, and, and Jesus tells his disciples this, now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee. This is verse 16 through 20 in Matthew chapter 28. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, let's push pause for a second. Jesus came and said to them, this is where we typically are really good compartmentalizers because we view what Jesus is about to say as some solo mission, as some isolated command of God, yet Jesus in his perfection and his righteousness and his holiness and his oneness with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit completely said these next few lines with what he had said just a little bit before in mind, to love God above all else, to love our neighbor. This is what Jesus says, time in. Verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You know, so many times we we love the part in there that says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, but we miss what Jesus says just the verse before that, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Man, that is our fuel. That is, we can go confidently 
we can go confidently that Christ is with us, that his spirit is with us, empowering us to do the very things that Christ has commanded from us. And what, a, what an incredible grace that God has given us to provide what he demands from us. That he provides the very thing that he demands. And so Jesus is saying here, hey, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Guess what? Not to you, to me. Therefore, knowing this, you go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. That's the main body. That's, that's the main point that I want to make this morning. That as we go and follow the command of Christ, that we do so not separating the great commandment from the great commission or the great commission from the great commandment. That as we go, as, as I assumed this morning, that I assumed that we have a heart for evangelism and for discipleship and for the local church and for Christ to return, that we're doing those things because God has sent us to proclaim the gospel to those whom he loves. Christ has come to save sinners. He's come to seek and to save that which was lost. And as we do these things, we do this with the love of Christ in our hearts. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is the, is the last passage I want to share with you. What is it the love that, that Christ's love does for us? It says this. I want to start in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are, but what we are is known to God and I hope it is known to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. I love this verse because Paul basically acknowledging he's kind of crazy. Verse 13, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. And this is what I want us to connect with the great commission, the great commandment. Verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us. Some versions would say the love of Christ compels us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, and therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. I feel like I just have to keep going. I was gonna stop there. Verse 16, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us, this is absolutely mind-blowing to me, And this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What an, what an absolutely earth-shattering passage of Scripture. What I, what, I, what I gain from that and what I think is right to gain from that is that Christ, Christ came to bring glory to the Father, Right? Christ came because he with the Father was one, came to bring glory to God. But I believe that we could lump all of the ministry of Christ into three little words, the ministry of reconciliation. And, and guess what Paul is saying here? That you, as a follower of Christ, have been given the same ministry as Jesus. You have been given the same ministry as Jesus Christ. It's not... I, I believe from my reading of scripture, it's not, it's not a ministry of lesser value. I believe that we, our ministry here is as valuable as the ministry of Christ when he came to this earth. Are we perfect? Are we righteous? 
Absolutely not. But Christ has ordained that the saving of people, the saving of sinners would happen through the proclamation of his word through broken vessels like you and me. And we have been given the same ministry as Christ had when he came and dwelled and lived on this earth. We have the same ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. And let me just tell you something right now as we get into a little more the practical implications of church planting. Reconciliation is a messy, messy ministry, right? Have, you, have any of you ever been reconciled to someone that you needed to be reconciled to? Was that, was that clean? Was that a clean process? In fact, there's probably some of you sitting in here this morning who's like, I got some people that I know I need to be reconciled to, but I ain't stepping into those, those waters because reconciliation is messy. And that's why I believe that Paul is saying it is the love of Christ that controls us. And I believe that when Jesus gave us the great commandment, he was saying, hey, listen, if you are going to fulfill the great commandment, you need to start a little bit more foundationally and, and love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and commit to loving your neighbor as yourself. Because Jesus is saying, because guess what? You are, you, are, you are like sheep going out among wolves. The ministry of reconciliation is a messy, messy, terrifying ministry. That means, let me just be a little more practical. That means that God has called us to love those who we disagree with. God has called us to love those on the other side of the political, oh goodness, the political aisle as us. God has called us to love those who, who live next door who don't keep up their yard work. Oh, now I'm, now I'm hitting some people, right? God has called us maybe rather than calling and, and, and I, guys, I'm just, I am, I'm revealing my own heart here. So this isn't judgment. This is revealing my own heart and my own temptations and my own desires. That means that rather than calling the city on the, on the neighbor next to you who's not caring for their yard, maybe you take your lawn equipment to your neighbor's house and say, can I help you? That's the ministry of reconciliation. And I, I believe fully that God is able to open doors to people to hear the gospel when we do this. That means that the family next door or the family behind your house who, who all you hear from their house is yelling and screaming and, and, and man, what kind of dysfunction is going on over there? I'll tell you what kind of dysfunction is going on. Sin is going on over there. Sinners who, have, who God has called us to love and to serve and to go out of our way to, to, to potentially have the opportunity to share the gospel with. You know, that's, that's always my, my warning in church planting. My warning in church planting is that, hey, if, if you are serious about planting churches, it's probably not gonna look a lot like this. It's probably not gonna look, at least for a little while, like what we are used to seeing and what we're comfortable with. Um, it's, it's going to mean that you have you, that you have more people in your living room and at your dinner table um, in the next few months than you may have had um, all the years leading up to that. It means that there's, there's certain things that we're really, really confident about in, confident about in Scripture, things that we are, we are zealous about, things that we will hold to, myself included, things that we will be very serious and we will not abandon these things, but, but then you start meeting people who aren't quite sure on what we're sure of. And it's not, it's not an opportunity for us to, to beat them over the heads with the Bible. It's an opportunity for us to love them. It's an opportunity for us to, to say, you know what, God, I am living out the Great Commission, going into all the nations, making disciples, teaching, loving, baptizing by the power of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's an opportunity for us to say, I'm doing that, but the fuel for that is that, you know what, I love you. I, I love you. Why? Because you are created in the image of God. Did you know that someone doesn't have to be a follower of Christ to be created in the image of God? Did you know that? Did you know that every person on this planet bears the dignity and bears the image of their creator? Every single person, no matter what the color of their skin is, no matter what their, 
this, this is what, where we get real controversial. No matter what their sexual orientation is, no matter what any of those things are, these people bear the image of their creator. And God has called us to the ministry of reconciliation because the, and the me- ministry of reconciliation is messy. And it will call for us to love people who do not deserve love. And this is where our fuel comes from, is that Christ has loved us when we were unworthy, when we were sinners, Romans chapter five, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I love, man, Paul is just like awesome. He goes on to say, one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Like people, not very often, people won't even die for someone who's good. But Christ shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What that means, in fact, the the original language, what it says there is that while you were in the act of sin, Christ died for us. So whatever sin it is that you're, you're hiding or whatever sin that you think is secret, Jesus on the cross looked ahead in time and, and, sa- and saw us in our sin and chose to die for those who would come to know him. While we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Our fuel also comes from John chapter one, which is one of my favorite uh, verses on the scripture. This isn't, very, this, isn't, uh, this, this isn't very Baptist of me, but if I were to ever get a tattoo, um, I would get something that would depict this passage. And I might just do that someday, just to tick some people off. Um, but but, but one of the, what, what I love about this is it says, John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Guess what? God has called you to be a missionary. You, you know what on, what on what foundation? That he is a missionary. That Jesus, that God the Father is a missionary God that Jesus went on the greatest missionary excursion that has ever been known to man. He left heaven and he came to earth to dwell among his people and to see people come to know Christ. You know what that is? That's a 33 year year long mission trip. That's what Jesus came to do. And out of his ministry, guess what happened? Acts chapter two happened. The day of Pentecost happened. Guess what happened after the day of Pentecost? Local churches were planted. In Philippians, one of my favorite books, you can find the genesis of the church at Philippi in Acts chapter 16. Go and read it there sometime. Guess, you, wanna know, you wanna know who started the church at Philippi? A woman named Lydia. So already she is excluded from Baptist church, the Baptist denomination. A woman named Lydia, a Philippian jailer, and a, and a demon-possessed girl. That is the, that's the ministry of reconciliation. That these three people, one who, who, whose hurdle, Lydia, whose hurdle might have been her, her success and her, and her, and her finances, um, a demon-possessed girl, you don't even need to know her hurdles. She, she couldn't see beyond the fog that was over her eyes. And then the Philippian jailer who had all sorts of cultural boundaries to planting a church. And yet God used these three people to plant one of the strongest local churches in the New Testament, the church at Philippi. And so we do this because God is a missionary God. Why do we attempt to do, coming back to the great commandment, the great commission, why, why do we so often attempt to do the mission of God apart from the heart of God? God's heart is for weak, vulnerable, broken people, which by the way, that's, that's you and me. That's you and me. Then why do we try to separate God's heart from God's mission that he has set us on. It is so important that we recognize these things. I want to tell you just a little bit about some of the things that we've seen over the last year. So in September of 2017, um, we moved. I'm from Oklahoma City, obviously went to school with Cole. Um, Went to Christian Heritage, moved away um, after my senior year of high school to college in Arkansas. Uh, I tell people all the time, I kind of, I was kind of, I was ready to see the world. And so what better place to do that than Arkansas, right? Um, and so moved to Arkansas um, with a friend of mine who actually planted Grace Harbor with. Uh, it's pretty cool. God, in fact, Hannah Mobley, who's here this morning, her brother, um, we have planted a church and we're like, man, this is a really small world. Um, I planted a church with Thomas after we moved to Arkansas in 2008 
lived there for 10 years, both found ourselves some, some Conway girls, married them. Um, they had our babies and we moved back to um, Oklahoma to plant this church. Um, and so uh, September of 2017, we just started as a small group of people in our living room. Uh, we were in our living room. There was about 10 of us. Um, by, by this time last year, we had grown to about 25 people. Um, and uh, most of those were my kids. Um, and so, uh, um, kind of, uh, we, we moved from a Sunday night gathering where we were just, where we were just really working to, to, to see what God's vision for Grace Harbor Church was. Um, and, and, and a year ago, April 1st, we, on Easter, we moved into some space to just start meeting um, and gathering weekly. Uh, we believe that um, the people of God are formed from God's word. We believe that it's God's word when proclaimed that births God's people. We don't believe that, you know, there's some weird writings in the sky or some extra biblical revelations. We believe that when God's people are formed, it's because they have heard the gospel proclaimed and the Holy Spirit has spoken it to them. And so we said, we want to be part of that. We want to, we want to do something that shows that the people of God grow from God's word. And so we want to meet Sunday mornings. Um, so we've been doing that for almost a year. Uh, we're a real small church. We've, we've got about 40, 45 people um, that gather with us every week. But our vision already, in fact, uh, just this past Jan- just just a couple months ago, January, we have partnered with um, a, a, a guy that lives in our area who's going to plant a church. And we've just said, you know what? We don't have all the financial resources, but what we do have, we are going to we are going to fund church planting and global missions with. And so we've partnered with a guy named Michael Wilson, um, who's right now just kind of trying to explore what church planting looks like for him. Um, and we're saying, you know what? God has been gracious in, in allowing us to form as a church. We want to do this for someone else. We want to fund and support prayerfully and financially uh, Michael and his family as they go and plant a church. And so um, we've, we tell our people, we, we have a, a heart for um, multiplication um, and four, on, at four different levels. We want to see the multiplication of disciples. Um, we, we don't merely want converts, by the way. The church is not called to make converts. The church is called to make disciples. And so we cast a vision and say, we want to see four different areas of multiplication. Disciples, we want to see people come to Christ and follow him. Uh, we, want to see, we want to see um, leaders developed and multiplied because we just believe that uh, the, the church should be, um, as, as uh, a, a book that I, that I have read that I really respect, as they say, would be the locus of leadership. The locus just means the center um, at, the, at the hub of the church should be what is producing leaders for the world um, in every area of life. And so we want to multiply disciples. We want to multiply leaders. We want to multiply groups. Um, our church was, the foundation of our church is actually small groups um, so we began meeting in a house, and when we, when we launched to a Sunday morning service, we launched a second group. Um, and so we want to see uh, more groups develop so that we can send groups into neighborhoods so that these groups can uh, minister to their neighbors where God has put them. Um, and maybe, maybe a church just pop out of that. I mean, church planning is really a lot less scary than a lot of us think it is. Um, it's a lot of times it's just going to happen when God's people are faithful in the places where he has them. And so we want, we want some people in their houses to just come together and gather. And who knows, maybe they see just a, a revival of their neighbors coming to know Christ and a church just pops out of that. And we'd say, awesome, go for it. Um, so we want to see, um, we want to see groups and then we ultimately want to see churches multiplied. Um, we don't view church planting and church multiplication as church split. Uh, we know how that goes. Um, we don't want to see churches split. We don't see groups split. Uh, maybe technically that's kind of what's happening, but we're referring to that as multiplication. Healthy things multiply. Um, we don't necessarily say that healthy things grow because you know, sometimes healthy things, uh, sometimes things grow that aren't healthy, right? Um, but we do believe that pretty, pretty universally you can say healthy things do multiply. Um, and so we are just casting a vision for multiplication. I have so much that I could speak on today. Uh, but I wanted to come in and give you a little bit about just what God has been stirring in our heart. I want to leave you with, with this. I hate to, I hate to leave it on um, something so uh, mechanical like this, but um, I get the question all the time, why, why would you plant a church in Oklahoma City? Why would you plant a church in Oklahoma? 
It's a great question. There's a church on every corner. In fact, this morning I was driving, took, took Gabe to McDonald's over here and was driving down a street where, I mean, there was, I, I looked left and there was a church and then I looked to my right, there was a church and I looked left, there was another church. So why plant a church in Oklahoma? Um, first of all, when we moved here, the first thing that we did was we reached out to other churches. We did not come here saying, uh, praise God, Grace Harbor is here. Now Oklahoma City can finally get saved. It wasn't one of those things. It was, hey, who is already doing great gospel work in this area? And who can we partner with? Who can we just say, hey, we're here not to compete with you or to steal your people. We are here to reach Oklahoma City with you. Um, and so a resource that has been put out um, by a group of Baptists in Oklahoma um, over, over a period of about five years, the, the, the state's total population as of 2017, I believe, um, the state's total population was 3,911,338 citizens. So that's, that's nearly 4 million people. 2.3 million of those, based on this research, are unchurched. That is over half of the people in Oklahoma are unchurched. You guys know how many people there are just here and more, right? Where are they? Well, my dad pastors a church just up the street and more, Southgate Baptist Church. They're not over there. I have friends who go to First Baptist Church more. These 2.3 million people, they're not there. Life Church, just off the highway up here, big church, but guess what? There's not 2.3 million people there. And so we have, we've, just, we've just taken this very seriously. And we said, you know what? There are people who need to know Christ. There are people who need to come to know Christ. And so our job is not to, to form another church of just warm bodies in a room. We want to engage our community through, through, through evangelism, through discipleship, and reach people for Christ so that the local church can strengthen because we believe that it's the local church that God has given the authority to and the commission to, to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. Even missionaries that we send out to the ends of the earth. My prayer is that those foreign missionaries are sent out from local churches and they have, they have connections with local churches and they go to foreign lands and they plant local churches there. And so we just took this 60% of unchurched people in Oklahoma seriously. And we said, something's gotta be done. Our churches need to be strengthened. Those that are existing need to be strengthened. And I believe that's what we're seeing in a lot of churches, but a lot of churches are also dying. And the truth is, is that at one point, Grace Community was a, was a church plant, right? It, this was planted at some point. It was started, started somewhere and at some point, and your life has been impacted by it. And I just believe that church planting is one of the most effective ways to reach people with the gospel of Christ because they just don't have a lot of things that they've got to, they, they don't have all these, these things in place that they have to, that they have to hurt all these hurdles. They're just able to say, you know what, we just want to reach these people for Christ. And as our church has grown, we've seen how some of these things have complicated, got, been more and more complicated, but we just saw that 60% of people would say, would profess and say, I have no church affiliation. I don't know Christ. I don't have a church. My grandma went to church. My grandma drugged me along to church a little bit over the years, but but I don't belong anywhere and I don't even believe in Christ. And so that's, that's a very short reason. If, if, if there's any way that I can answer any more questions about church planting, I'm sorry that I, I didn't come in and, and basically just tell you this is how you plant a church. I believe that the way that we plant churches is for having a heart for evangelism, a heart for discipleship, a heart for the local church, and a heart to see Christ returned. And man, churches will be planted. I've heard, I've, one, of my, one of my mentors says, don't plant churches plant the gospel. Um, and I believe that when we plant the gospel because we have a heart for evangelism, discipleship, local church, and the return of Christ, that the church is going to be birthed because God's word forms, shapes, births God's people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for um, the call that you've placed on our lives. Um, you, haven't, you haven't placed a call in our life that um, is somehow disconnected from from the ministry that you have done, Lord, you have actually called us to the same ministry um, that you were here to accomplish, the ministry of reconciliation. And may we see, Lord, this morning that um, we don't follow this begrudgingly, but we follow this joyfully. We see the difference that you've made in our life. We recognize 
um, the life change that has happened because of your grace in our life, that we desire to see other people encounter that same grace. And Lord, may we do this out of an overwhelming joy and urgency to see other people come to know you. God, I pray this morning, um, I pray for Grace Community Baptist Church. Lord, whatever it is that lies ahead for them, that you would, um, that you would just give them confidence and boldness and, and, and what you have called them to do here and um, that, that there would be nothing that, that would, would discourage them. Lord, as you've promised us, uh, you, you will build your church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Lord, if the gates of hell will not prevail against it, then that means that the, our culture won't prevail against it. Politics won't prevail against the church. Um, there is nothing that can destroy your church because you've promised us that you will build it. We won't build it, you will. But God, we thank you that you have chosen weak, broken, imperfect people to do this supernatural work. Father, we pray these things in your name. Amen.